Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast, the place to be for drama teachers, drama students, and theater educators everywhere. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello. I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. This is episode 144, 144, and you can find any links for this episode in the show notes. Where are they? Theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 144. All right. Today, in this episode, which would be 144, we're going to look at theater in a new light. And I think that's the amazing, awesome, wonderful, spectacular thing about theater. Uh... It's not static. It doesn't have to be. It's malleable. It's changeable. You can approach the act of theater in so many different ways. It can happen in a theater. It can happen in a parking lot. It can be realistic, absurd, intimate, epic. You know, people can break into song at any moment and people will go, yeah, that's theater. You can take a piece of theater and put it in a different style. You can take something from another genre and adapt it to a theatrical form. All of this, all this uh, different explorations and approaches, uh, those are the reasons that I love theater and why I like writing and and being in this form. So that's what we're going to do today. Look at uh, theater in a new light. So first, we're going to talk to Clark Taylor. Clark is a drama teacher in Georgia, and he took a podcast and adapted it to the stage using shadow puppetry, live actors and live music. And when I got that email from Clark, oh, I knew I wanted to talk to him about this. So and after I talked to Clark, I'm going to talk to a group of students who took one of my plays and adapted it into a film, used their uh, school as the location, as the landscape. Uh, but first, we talked to Clark. Let's get to it. All right. I am here today with Clark Taylor. Hello, Clark. Hey, how's it going? Awesome. How are you? Just fantastic. I like to hear that. All right. So uh, so first off, tell everyone in the world where you are situated. Well, right now, I'm uh, direct from my living room in Atlanta, Georgia. Awesome. And uh, how long have you been a drama teacher? Um, I've been a drama teacher a long time. <laughs> Is it too long, too long to put yeah, numbers? I mean, you may as well cut my leg off and count <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's just say that. Let's but, say yeah, I, I really I didn't get started though until uh, I was out of college and I was you know, pursuing my career here in Atlanta. And I don't know. Uh, I've, I've gone through all these other uh, art artistic bugs in my life, starting as a visual artist and then as a musician, composer, actor. I did lots of designing here in Atlanta. And uh, teaching just called to me. I just mm-hmm. really found niche there and able to use the gifts I had artistically to uh, kind of combine that. So um, there's a reason of finishing my master's up at uh, the Ashland Center for Theater Studies in uh, Southern Oregon mm-hmm. there. And uh, um, it's just been wonderful. Well, that's uh, awesome. To be able to share that, yeah. Yeah, I think that's pretty wonderful to say you've been teaching since the dawn of time, and uh, and yet that your last thought about it is that it's still wonderful. Yeah, it is. It's it's really uh, completes the uh, the teaching artist in me. I think uh, very very much. I I love that I get to go in and as a teacher and as a director to use uh visual and aural elements to uh share the storytelling that i think is so unique and so important to uh what we get to do i think yeah and i think at its heart i mean um theater is a visual medium we sometimes forget that yeah yeah and i think it's interesting you know how we're we're going to come more to talking about this how uh, the show we did came around from a oral medium, a podcast, and makes its way <laughs> on stage uh, as a, a visual 
driven peace. Well, that gets us right into the heart of what we're talking about today. So uh, Clark uh, um, sent me an email and told me about his production that um, highlighted shadow puppetry and also a, a awesome use of, you had five uh, overhead projectors that right. you used. And I just think that that is a, um, uh, what a great, a, a different aspect of, of theater. And it, it makes it completely visual in terms of because yeah. it's, we need to see when we're looking at the shadow puppetry, we need to, that's what we've got in terms of, we've got shadows in terms of making that happen. So let's get into, um, why did you go from an oral, from the, or from an oral podcast medium and, and choose, uh, a sh- a par- partly shadow puppetry to illuminate it. Yeah, great story. Um, our creative director at school, Trey Bowden, he and I did a production together of a verbatim drama by Annabelle Sotar based on the uh, GMO battle uh, over a uh, canola farmer. And it was a really cool experience. We got to implement a lot of visual elements of a little shadow puppetry and overhead projectory and we had like a video monitor wall and it was fantastic and so he approached me uh last school season said that he was able to uh scare of this uh cult following podcast called welcome to night vale and uh, he had gotten permission to uh let us stage it and so I said, wow, fantastic and great. And then the more I started listening to the podcast, I mean, it's it's one, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's kind of like. <laughs> I am I, familiar with it. And it's it's the Twilight Zone. Yes, yes, yes. And it's a, you know, to call it a, it is a podcast, but it's not like this podcast where we're talking <laughs> interviews and stuff. It's much more out there. Yeah, a really wonderful <laughs> guard experimental piece. And so we went around with, well, how, you know, we're, we wanted to stage this and, and still keep the uh, elements of what made that such a, a cool, unique podcast in place. And so where our black box theater is really presented a wonderful opportunity for us. Before it was a black box, it was a weight conditioning room. Oh, okay. Let's pause and let that sink in for everybody. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> and let me say it. Let me verbalize it for everybody. Okay. Oh my God. Yes. So just a so a sweaty box, yeah. basically. Yeah. It, it smells like sweaty actors now. <laughs> well, okay. But it's you know it's a small space uh, and it is divide it divides uh, between it the uh, school cafeteria by a wall with uh, four big panels of glass. And their eventual purpose is that they were going to just remove that wall and make it one big old giant cafeteria until I said, wow, this would just make a fantastic black box for us and give us a place uh, to do more intimate theater and really experiment. And the school has always been wonderful in, in letting us explore and innovate and collaborate artistically. So uh, fast forward, a dear friend of mine and an amazing puppeteer, Lee Bryan. In fact, that's, it's not a Lee Bryan, that puppet guy. <laughs> uh, we've done a lot of shows together and implementing puppetry, but I never had a chance to do uh, a lot of big shadow puppetry with him. And so he came in and looked at those glass panels and said, whoa, <laughs> like, this would just make an incredible uh, shadow puppetry uh, opportunity for you. So I said, what? We're going to have the audience sit out in the cafeteria <laughs> and watch the show on, on these glass panels. And he said, yeah. And so uh, that's where I started discovering the oneness of low-tech overhead projectors. I have I have myself done a... I did a tour with... A, uh, I did a shadow puppetry version of Romeo and Juliet in which we used uh, low-tech, uh, we only had one, low-tech uh, projectors. I think they're, I mean... It's, it's amazing. It's just yeah. wonderful, rough magic that happens when you start you know, pushing that medium around and seeing all the just incredible opportunities you have to do things. Uh, I'll do another shout-out. Lee said, you got to watch this group out of Canada called, and I love the name, Manual Cinema. Mm-hmm. 
and that's all they do. It's just overhead, shadow, puppetry, and live action in front of you know various uh, light elements and that. And so that's what we went for. We had live actors who were acting and interacting with what we were doing on the overhead projectors. Um, just took bed sheets and made uh, some roll-up blinds for the glass panels. We incorporated a live band uh, because the podcast itself, uh, for their sections at the say, and now the weather, they have uh, music. <laughs> and so we had live band uh, playing outside, and actors sometimes that would uh, go in front of the panels as the story was unfolding. So it was a theatrical experience that none of us had uh, talked with before. And for the students, it was just fantastic because they had the opportunity to experiment as technicians and as artists and actors. So if they weren't, you know, behind a projector and... Uh, <laughs> manipulating cardboard and, you know, light gel and whatever. They were on stage in all kinds of apparatus and costumes uh, performing. So it was really wonderful. So, okay, so there's two things that I want to... One, I want to, like, get into that whole... the student response side. But can yeah. you just break down a little bit about what exactly you... how you use the projectors? Can you visually sort of just talk about, for anybody listening, like, what do yeah. you... you know, how... what do you mean? How do you use an overhead projector? Sure. And, and what is the final effect? Yeah. So we had four to five of uh, these. A couple of them were at school, and the rest I just got really cheap off of eBay. And they're just the old, you know, transparency projector. We measured them out and had them all set and sort of, you know, rough calibrated that we could show single images off of each panel of glass. You know, we had a projector for every panel, but we could also configure it to show one big continuous image using four. But that took a lot of uh, rehearsal. Uh, off of the puppeteers to uh, pull that off. We mounted them just on some tables that we had for height and experimented with uh, material. Uh, the bed sheet was incredibly great. Payoff, we didn't have to spend a lot of money to uh, get any twin screens or that for it. And then we had a fifth overhead projector that was our sort of... Uh, Moving camera, we had it on a little track that we could move back and forth uh, in front of the other projectors. So we had some animation with it for scenes that we wanted to uh, do. We had like a moon going across. So everything that was done was manually operated. We had no computerized technology happening. We wanted it to be... Uh, authentic, and, you know, some of the kids said, well, it's like acoustic projection. <laughs> uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, it is. And well, in this world, you know, that we live in right now, where everything is CGI and everything is that, that I'm sure your students are of that age where they expect spectacle mm -hmm. that is computer driven. Yeah. And to be able to provide them with an opportunity where the spectacle is of their own creation, both artistically and and actually physically, mm -hmm. I think that's very cool. All right. Yeah. And I think because a lot of the imagery we used was silhouetted, I think a lot of that imagination uh, buy-in from the audience and from the performers as well just really paid off. That, as you're saying with CGI, that we're having so much of our imagination filled in for us uh, by the uh, crazy special effects that uh, we're given a steady diet of. And so this, uh, I keep going back, it's just a wonderful rough magic that came out of this experience. And for the audience, they were uh, blown away. The, they'd never seen anything like it. Our, our headmaster was uh, very impressed. Uh, they, we had a show and share afterwards that everyone can come backstage, which was in the black nice. box, and see you know all the mirrors and smoke uh, 
that we'd been doing. And when they see how simple it was, that was just, you know, <laughs> overhead projectors and a whole lot of transparency sheets and some cardboard for cutouts and, you know, mock costumes, uh, they were really uh, thinking, wow, that's really incredibly impressive. Did you ever, did you play with color at all? Or was it yeah. everything, yeah? Yeah, we did. Uh, and as I said, you know, we just got, you know, a couple of uh, gel, light gel sample packs <laughs> And we made mosaics with them. Um, we used uh, translucent markers and paint to do a lot of color on it. Um, we had a couple of LED lights that we hung in some places to give us a big broad wash of color. And also it colored shadows nicely. So we kind of incorporated that. But the majority of it was coming off of the overheads. And the nice thing about our ring world now is that you could grab images. You'd, you, know, you didn't have to be a great artist. There's just tons of clip art that we could manipulate a little and then throw it on these uh, transparency sheets and just print them out. Mm-hmm. I, and, I find that amazing so, now because I think you can just throw them into a printer, can't you? Yeah. 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 And you can do black and white or color. Wow. Isn't that... I, th- I think that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, some of the more animated things, you know, we just built. We learned to uh, experiment with scale a lot in the process. And also because the projectors themselves mounted were about, oh, three, four feet apart from each other. So doing a scene, we had one scene where there was this rolling man, just rolling left to right. But we had to have four images of him. And we had to rehearse the, so when he went off of, you know, the first screen, our second puppeteer is moving their rolling guy. So to make it look uh, consistent uh, and continuous, uh, that took a lot of rehearsal time. And it was, it was just fun. It was the most fun exploration we, we had. It was incredibly hard work. Uh, granted, to be sure, but we, we all kind of felt like pioneers, <laughs> sure. about this, you know, playing with this 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 new this new medium. Okay, so then let's talk about your students. What was their initial response when you said, "Okay, we're this is what we're doing"? Yeah, there's 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 a, a long pause <laughs> <laughs> for the buy in. I think it is going back to what you're saying about uh, the, the this this generation has grown up. Uh, in a, a technological uh, digital world that they've seen, you know, all this amazing contrived uh, digital stuff in film and on TV. And so uh, when I was pitching this to them, it was, it was hard for them to wrap their, their heads around it, but they, you know, trusted me. They know I'm pretty crazy anyway, but uh, accomplished uh, a lot of wonderful things. Uh, so they bought in. And uh, as we started uh, moving and uh, manipulating and creating the stuff, they really got into it and were, uh, from that point, being inspired and innovative to uh, come back and say, look, what happens when I do this with this gel and this you know, piece of fabric? Yeah. And so it was a wonderful discovery process. And they uh, ended up just owning it themselves and I was able to move back more and more uh, and and let them go and that was just uh, the most satisfying for me oh yeah like because like what a wonderful thing that that something that is sort of met with resistance ends up becoming their own creation Mm -hmm. yeah and yeah they're so proud of it and uh, so we're to uh, show folks when uh we went backstage to see the things you could just see it in your faces and so proud and just watching folks face when they saw you know what it really was making all the uh, fantastic uh phantasmagorical uh show happen and i just uh, and i uh, so uh so where do you think that having this experience for them um, what was their takeaway and that what would they, well, how are they going to, how can they apply it? Went off and did an internship at, uh, the center for puppetry arts. It's our, uh, big, uh, organization, major, uh, puppetry organization here in Atlanta. 
And she went off and did an internship with him <laughs> because she was so inspired. Oh my God, that's really cool. Like, and like, and expected. Yeah, yeah. And they, uh, I, I think they've become ve- uh, more interested in the visual aspects of, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, the simplicity mm. uh, effect w- with theater that a small, small thing can uh, just get so much uh, creating empathy and excitement. That was uh, a big discovery for a lot of them. You know what, too? Because, um, because there is so much emphasis in, in their daily lives on spectacle, and we say, you know, theater can be intimate, theater can be small, mm-hmm. and what sometimes ends up happening is it's like it's bare stages and, and, and acting, which is fine. I'm very happy with that. But mm-hmm. what a great way to introduce two students this is how we can be simple and this is how we can be mm. theatrical and yet spectacle. Yeah. Yeah. The other interesting thing that came out of it was the uh, aural aspect that we, we had gone with uh, deciding on, you know, there are so many episodes. We decided we were going to do the pilot episode of uh, Welcome to Night Vale. And then another piece was called Story About You. And, rehearsal we had made a lot of uh, recorded uh, voiceover work with our our main actor but at the end we made a big decision to to go back with him live and that made a really big difference in our first act our second act was so loaded with uh, audio <laughs> uh things that were happening live and uh on um recorded medium that uh it was r- another wonderful experience for the students to you know to see in just those two acts uh the variety and uh, that they could do with it that's awesome so if you are speaking to a, a teacher who is um listening and a- about implementing a yeah. shadow puppetry what mm-hmm. what advice would you give them um I would uh, give them some advice. There's a lot of great books out there, and a lot of them dedicated to overhead projectionary. Can I say that? Projectionary? I say you can. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> one, one, and one of the things is called, I think it's called World of Shadow. That's a great book, and uh, it, it kind of gives you a wonderful scale that, you know, you know, here's what you can do if, you know, you, 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 with just a sheet and uh, a, a flashlight and showing you the uh, small scales of, of working with, overhead pro- with just one overhead projector, a uh, bill screen that's got some great uh, schematics in there, and uh, that's, that was really helpful to us that uh lee recommended and just you know go out there uh use the internet get on google uh check out manual cinema uh it will blow you away the unique thing about them is that you get to see all the manipulation happening right in front of you the way they situate themselves that you can see the puppeteers doing their thing but right above them is the screen that it's all happening and Oh, I like that because it, then it, it's it's uh, you, it's a learning thing too. Yeah, yeah, and you know they use live music. All their stuff's original, but it it's just mind blowing what they can do, and it's just all manipulated. It's all hand manipulated. Uh, it's it's like watching a, a magic show. <laughs> you know? But yeah. you're, you're you're getting to see how they do the trick, but it's still. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> well, isn't that that's the best kind of magic when the 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 mechanics of the trick don't actually matter. It's the it's still yeah. You know, it's a trick, and it's still awesome. Yeah, and isn't it with with theater that you know we we come in and you know we want to escape and 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 buy into you know we're looking at Elsinore Castle and we we know it's made out of uh, foam block and two by fours. I think with the, the the puppetry, there's there's I don't know there's this, this old uh, magic uh, about it that it seemed like our audience was willing to just totally go with it, um, 
and uh, be caught up in the story. Do you think it mattered that you weren't you weren't telling a children's story, um, but using you know something like puppetry, you know, quote unquote, as a as a as a children's technique? Do you think that 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 mattered or that not mattered that that made a difference? I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, all the uh, parents, adults that came to it, uh, they were just amazed that you know they could enjoy something like that. I think uh, they uh, a lot. Uh, there was a lot of the curious that came in to experience it, and uh, a lot of them just walked out, just saying, "I've never seen anything like that." It was amazing, um, and so you know, I, I think. And, and granted, there's lots of of uh, adult puppetry out there that that's happening, shadow and, and and otherwise. I just I just think we're seeing more of that here. You know, with things like Avenue Q and all the mm. great stuff that Julie Taymor did to bring uh, big puppetry into the theater uh, with Lion King. She just used so many different uh, varieties of it in that. And uh, plays with like Manuel Cinnamon and another great Canadian troupe called the Old Trout uh, Puppet Company. And they use a lot of that technique as well as uh, other manipulative uh, art. So, yeah, I think I think it's there for everyone. Well, it and it's and it's it's pretty much the definition of a theatrical experience. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I think you get it. <laughs> I think you get it all. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Clark, thank you so much for sharing this. I think that I, I, it's, it's, these are the kinds of things that we want to sort of get out there. That it's it's possible. We don't need big budgets, and we don't need fancy. Um, Sets, lights, and costumes, we can do it all yeah. with an overhead projector. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Ah. Uh. So awesome. Okay, so now, so Shelby County High School in Kentucky, they worked on a production of one of my plays, Agatha Rex, and they approached the play differently. They wanted to approach it as a, a film project rather than a theater piece. So let's talk to them, see how it worked, see what they did. <laughs> Okay, I am talking to some folks at uh, Shelby County High School in Kentucky, and these guys have been working on a production of Agatha Rex, and they've approached the show differently. They've been uh, filming it, using it as a film project um, rather than a theater piece. And I've got a couple of guys here. I have uh, Trent Moody. He played uh, Dr. Creon in Agatha Rex. I have the director, Harrison Baldwin. Josh Berry, co-director. Trey Stallnaker. And Gabe Lehman. And, uh, you're a tech guy. Okay, so Harrison, let's start with you. Why did you decide to do this as a film project instead of uh, instead of directing it as a theater piece? Uh, well, uh, a couple of reasons, really. Um, kind of the uh, initial one was like, yeah, let's try to take a different take on this, do something different. But also it um, worked out even better with us having only uh, one hour intervals uh, to work on it, to practice it. And there's really no time to um, perform it or have extended um, rehearsals with people uh, with it just being kind of a class and um, um, not being able to come after school and work on it for long periods of time. So it worked out even better that we could film it and adapt it. And also it's a cool challenge that we wanted to take on, um, try to do it a little differently. And uh, so that was the the thought behind it. Okay, we're just going to take this and then we're going to put it on film. And then how was the reality of filming this? What was your biggest challenge? Um, The biggest challenge was probably um, the takes and the cuts and like where to cut it and where to start filming again. Because I don't know, when you watch watch a movie or whatever, you're like, oh, this flows really nicely. And it's difficult when you're on the other side to think, how are we going to make this flow as nicely as we see on TV or in, in the movies? Josh, you were working with Harrison on this, and so what was your what was your job as co-director? Uh, I was more of a stage manager. Ah, uh, okay. So what was your job? Uh, so like he would give me like the idea, he would cut the script uh, and change it to where it would fit with the recording aspect instead of us on a stage. So I would just uh, I would put people where he wanted them to go, tell them what they were going to do, and kind of. Did the more on the personal level rather than uh, like the like the small picture rather than the big picture was kind of my my job. Did you have to handle the actors? I did. <laughs> I did. Okay, Trent, what was it like being handled? 
Uh, at, to- <laughs> at times it was kind of frustrating, but it was fun. Yeah, what was it like uh, working on this as a film project? Uh, it was a bit different than actually doing it on stage because it, it gets more personal when it's like on camera. How so? Like, you see yourself doing it, whereas if you're on stage, you just perform it for people. So you get that have feedback on yourself. Yeah, it's a much different experience, is it, when you uh, you can hide a little bit on stage, can't you? Because you, you don't really know what you look like and what you sound like, but there's that, that... You're right, it's a real intimacy in film. You can actually... You see all the flaws, everything very up close. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah? What would you... Uh, and uh, So how did you... Because uh, Dr. Creon, he's a big character. He's a, he's a, um, he's the principal. He's, um, um, he's, he's not really vicious, but he's, he's very stern and he's very, um, uh, unchanging, unwavering. How did you play him? Uh, I kind of, like, when I was doing his voice, like, I did him kind of angry with a little bit of sarcasm because, like, he knew he was getting to the student as he was talking to them. And it was it was really fun. Yeah, how so? Because I I, I got to mess with the students while I, <laughs> on the serious note, I also got to mess with them, and it was kind of a fun experience. All um, right, and tell me, Gabe. So you were uh, you did sound? Is that right? Uh, I did sound and lighting, and all kinds of stuff, really. And what what were the challenges for you? Uh, well, actually, you know, honestly, I, I feel like shooting the play on camera would made it a lot easier, you know, problem shooting was a lot easier, you know, to speak up or get closer, or open up, and it's a lot easier to hear you and see you and all kinds of stuff, where if you're shooting on the stage, you know, you're going to take 10 to 20 minutes at a time trying to figure out what you can do to fix what you're doing, but on camera, it was a lot, it was a lot easier. Did you have to, uh, what's your experience working with sound? Uh, actually, this is the first time I've ever done it, and I really enjoyed it. Awesome. How about you, uh, Harrison and Josh? Was this your your first time uh, working with film? Um, it was actually we've done uh, working with film. Yes, we've done uh, various other projects in the class that uh, where we've kind of taken the director role, I guess you could say. But this was our first time actually filming it and uh, using the cameras and the more technological stuff. And why do you think that Agatha Rex worked well uh, as a film project? Well, first off, we had a great setting to do it in because, you know, we're... <laughs> in a school. <laughs> in a school, yeah. So that made it easy to find areas to film and get offices and things like that. Um, it was good uh, because... Sorry, what was your question again? Sorry, you could repeat that. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. So I just want to know why why it worked well. This particular play worked well as a film project. So we know that your location worked well. What about the the content of the story? Um, it worked. Um, it worked well. I guess the location. You could say that even the people in it work over. They understand. They go through the stuff that Agatha. Well, not as drastic, but they go through the stuff every single day. Like the egotistical teacher, uh, controlling, trying to be over controlling and doing uh, whatever they want. So they understand that. They can uh, sympathize and really understand and get into character because it's close to uh, the persona that they take on every single day. And um, uh, so, are you? Have you finished? Do you have a final? Have you, do you have a finished product of your film yet? Um, we're working on it. We're working on finally uh, piecing it together. But we had it. It's taken so long because we had to take a break. Because uh, here at Shelby County, we did like a fine art spectrum. So all the arts department put on a presentation, and so the drama department put on just a section of our um, of the Agatha Rex that actually was performed on stage. So we got a little bit of that too. Um, and so we just had to take a certain certain parts and actually put mend them together and put them together to make a one coherent uh, piece scene um, and so we've been working on that for the past few weeks to get that ready to be presented right so now you've got back to so what's your uh, what's going to be the final the final cut of this is how long is it going to be do you think um, it's really hard to tell with all the because uh, it really has been pieced together we're working on piecing together act one and I'm still kind of filming act two and so um, it'll probably be uh, I don't know an hour close to an hour probably 30 45 minutes that's a pretty huge project eh yeah yeah, I think that's a really that's a really amazing undertaking that uh, that you guys have put on. Okay, so let's talk. Let's uh, go through each one of you guys. I want you to tell me um, what's something that you learned on this project that you can um, that you 
you're going to apply to the next project that you work on. So let's go through. So Trent, what's one thing that you learned working on Agatha Rex this way? Uh, if in the next production, if I do one, to be an authority figure, I know how it would feel to be that so I could better depict it. Yeah, you've got some now you've got some muscle memory, right? You've got uh, by working on this type of character, you could play this type of character again. Is this kind of character in your in your natural personality or is it completely different? Uh, I'm not usually a mean person. So no. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, it's good. It's it's good that you're not a mean person. Uh, we try to shy away from that, right? Uh, what about um, working on film itself? What's something that you learned working on film? that you can apply next time. About like, like just the aspects of it, like knowing where to stand, like in terms of where the camera is. Because if it's like real close, you don't want to be like all up on the camera. It's a very specific medium, isn't it? Like you can't, like a lot of times on stage, there's a lot of, you can get away with wandering around and maybe like making some different choices with your blocking. In film, because everything is so tight, you, you really have to, um, you know, know what your know what your mark is and really hit it, right? Uh, Harrison, did you have trouble with people not hitting their uh, getting their their marks and they're hitting their place what they were supposed to? Um, yeah, sometimes in the beginning, gradually, uh, got better as they got um, more comfortable with uh, the filming and stuff. But that also was another way that filming worked out because you know if that happened, someone uh, missed a cue, missed a line, or anything like that happened, just uh, do another take. Awesome. Harrison, what's one thing that you learned, have you learned in this process that you yeah, would you uh, apply? Uh, you got to be flexible. You can't have a, I mean, you can have a plan, but when we started, we tried to have map out, like, this day we're filming this, we're filming exactly this. And so that, within two days, that was just all over the place. <laughs> and so you just got to learn to adapt and learn to be flexible. And uh, with the, taking the break to do the fine art spectrum and uh, having to kind of mend the script to make for what we were trying to accomplish with that. You just got to be able to be flexible and take on whatever challenge and uh, uh, do it the best you can and with a good attitude. And Josh, how about you? What did you learn about in this project? Oh, well, it would be kind of the same thing with flexibility, but in a different uh, way. Because I had to deal with the, the actors and some days I didn't want to do anything. Uh, <laughs> so what did you do? Well... <laughs> that actor wasn't in a scene that was on later we'd have to like shoot that one instead of the one we were uh, previously going to uh, a take um, I just had to just had to figure out you know use use what I had to uh, make this scene I guess right okay Trey what did you learn in this process uh, mainly to adapt that sometimes you're not always going to be the big dog so you gotta change your characters up. Okay, and Gabe? Well, I, I learned to uh, take charge. Nice. So, you know, some of the people they want to work together, but you know, you have to you have to make sure that they're working together. You know, they're adapting to each other. And uh, you know, it played a really big role in that. Just getting as far as we have right now, really. Awesome. Okay. Uh what do you think, guys? Is that uh, is that basically? Uh, I think that's probably uh, what we've got on this project, eh? I uh, I hope that uh, I hope that it all comes together for you. And uh, was it fun working on this project? Definitely. Definitely. definitely? Awesome. Yeah. That's. Well, that's all we can ask for, right? That at least, at least it was. I'm really, I'm really impressed that it was. It's going to be such a. I guess I know the play is that long, but uh, to put together a, an an hour long film project like that, that's a lot of. Uh, that is a lot of work. Um, Harrison, are you and Josh putting together the final edit? Uh, us and Gabe. Are out. you and Gabe? Okay, cool. Um, I think that's great. Okay, well, all the best with that. Well, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you for talking to me. Yeah, thanks for having us. Okay. Bye, bye Trent. See ya. See ya. Bye, Harrison. Bye. Thank you, Josh. See ya. Thank you, Trey. See you. And thank you, Gabe. Have a great day. All right. You too. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks. Bye. bye. Thank you, guys. So that was Trent Moody. He played Dr. Creon in the uh, project. Harrison Baldwin was the director. Uh, Trey Stalnicker was another character, Elliot. And Gabe Lehman was the tech. 
So before we go, let's do some theater folk news. It's a play feature, it's a play feature, it's time to feature a play. So I wanted to direct you to one of our brand new plays that looks at theater in a new light, in a different light. And actually, it's not really a new light. It's a completely old light. It's a, a very, um, it is a, a theater as radio play. So we have Dead Men Don't Do Radio Plays by Allison William. This collection of two plays. So there's two uh, one act plays in here. We have Dead Men Don't Carry Handbags uh, Dead Men and Dead Men Don't Jaywalk. They both uh, feature the uh, same character, Steve Powell who is radio star Frank Grayson, Private Eye. Uh, so on, on, the, uh, on the radio show, he's your typical suave, you know, has a way with the ladies, Private Eye. Not so much in real life. Not suave, no ways with the ladies, and has this habit of narrating his life. But that doesn't stop crimes from falling into his lap in his life. So can this guy step into his character's shoes and get the dame? Well, you're going to have to read the play to find out. So this is such a great format for your students. Um, And Allison has done an amazing job with being very specific with the sound effects that you can use. And just a, there's a, a great, a nice essay at the end about about putting on radio plays and how you can do it in the traditional style and still in front of an audience. So that's Dead Men Don't Do Radio Plays. I'm going to put the link in the show notes, which you can find at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 144. Finally, where, oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every second Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com forward slash theaterfolk, and you can find us on the Stitcher app. You can also subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you got to do is search for the word, what is it? Theaterfolk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care. Take care.